Good morning to those of you with us on the West Coast of the United States. And uh, to those people on the East Coast, uh, a good afternoon. Uh, we are also joined by people uh, in Poland, uh, where it's uh, just late afternoon. And our special guest, Eliana Adler, is um, joining us uh, from Israel uh, at uh, 7 p.m. So we welcome all of our guests uh, to Freighted Legacies. This is a series of programs that we've held um, every few weeks to discuss the history and culture that Jews participated in uh, in Poland. This is an attempt to recover some sense of what we left behind. Many of us are children of survivors. Many of us um, are aware that about 85% of at least American Jews are descended from Poland and a considerable number of Jews around the world. Uh, so this is an opportunity for us uh, to connect in a more uh, significant way with uh, our past. And of course, our past is always uh, freighted, uh, a term that uh, I've asked us to think about with uh, uh, some uh, consideration. In fact, in fact, Marek Yuzowski, who I will introduce in a moment, uh, has uh, found um, a Polish equivalent, which we're going to ask him to announce today at some point. Um, uh, our past, past is um, loaded with both the good and the bad, with the complex um, issues that we face. Uh, at this point, I want to introduce uh, the chair of Beit Polska, which is part of the Friends of Jewish Renewal efforts in Poland. Uh, Marek will bring you greetings and a little bit of an update of what's going on in Poland at this time. Mark? Thank you very much, uh, Chaim. Uh, let me just uh, say hello to all those who are listening. And uh, so happens that today's uh, 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 introduction into a book about uh, um, uh, uh, Polish Jews or Jews from Central Europe uh, finding refuge in uh, uh, Soviet Union uh, coincides with another movement of a massive number of people from roughly speaking the same area, geographical and historical area. Uh, the people of Ukraine are forced to take, uh, to experience the lot of refugees. They are moving west primarily, of course. And that's where they're finding or seeking to find refuge. And of course, their history will be laden or freighted as a result with individual experience, mass experience, um, whatever they encounter in these countries, whatever they will be experiencing in terms of their internal uh, world of uh, individuals, families, uh, very often uh, rent uh, between those who stayed and those who left. Mm, uh, and uh, there are massive number of perils, of course, that come to mind. It was just less than an hour ago that I listened to the speech of uh, Prime Minister uh, of, of President Zelensky's uh, to the Knesset, uh, which was televised and broadcast all over the world in real time. And I was able to hear it as well in live interpretation into Polish by one of my colleagues, so happens. I'm a professional uh, uh, conference interpreter. Uh, so the world is, is truly a, a small world, but at the same time, it, uh, the, the contrasts and the typical differences in those who are privileged, those who are uh, um, underprivileged, those who experience safety and those who experience extreme, uh, extreme uh, um, point of, a uh, point of, uh, let's say, existential threat, or even death is, is, has not disappeared, it's still there, it's with us. Uh, on this uh, day and night of equinox, we seem to be hanging in balance between these two extremes. Um, let me just uh, 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 add one more word about uh, uh, what is happening in Poland. 
uh, you may hear you may have been reading on the news and and hearing on on uh, uh, on various uh, channels be it television or social media uh, that a majority of the influx in fact two thirds of the of the uh, let's say refugee movement uh, from Ukraine has landed in Poland and continues to pour into Poland. Uh, and uh, mm, there, the response, uh, uh, the response uh, is both uh, uh, communal, um, uh, government or mostly municipality level, not government. Government tries to coordinate, but ultimately it's down to citizens, just uh, down to NGOs and individuals uh, who open up their houses, who provide food and clothing, uh, and somehow try to accommodate uh, uh, their lives into and accommodate the, the new guests, the new arrivals in their lives. Um, of course, these are the early days. We have only experienced this for 23 days, and this is not likely to go away within the next 25 or something days. We are bracing ourselves for the longer term. Uh, the Jewish community, be it uh, uh, minuscule from on whatever standards you look at, the remnant in Poland is uh, nonetheless uh, living and uh, uh, has been energized by uh, by um, by this uh, ex experience that we we're seeing of uh, Ukrainians, and uh, um, we have not only acted individually, we have banded together to. Uh, to create a response uh, on a communal level. Uh, the progressive uh, uh, Jews here also, uh, represented by uh, Beit Polska and individual uh, Kehilot around the country, have also managed to, uh, to plan and think and strategize. And of course, there are two types of responses. One are ad hoc, when we identify specific needs, uh, and try to respond to them immediately. But we are also thinking very seriously about uh, how we can brace ourselves for longer term uh, stay of the, of the uh, uh, incoming uh, war refugees. And uh, we have been preparing uh, uh, programs that will require a major effort to, to launch and to maintain, particularly we're thinking of addressing ourselves to the needs of uh, preschool children. And uh, we are trying to create daycare uh, centers, maybe temporary, maybe, uh, uh, but uh, as many as can be, because most of the population coming into Poland are uh, women with small children. The, the school age children manage to be accepted to public schools, but uh, uh, Poland is very, very, uh, 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 let's say, has a shortage of uh, preschool uh, uh, positions. And uh, now with influx of about more, we have more than 2 million, uh, 2 million refugees in Poland already, and half of that number are children. So imagine the scale of the of the need, and imagine uh, uh, how we need to work uh, and how fast we need to work in order to uh, to uh, launch and uh, roll out a, a, a system of pop up um, uh, pop up uh, uh, daycare centers in whatever free space we we are able to identify and get some uh, our hands on. Uh, hopefully free of charge, if not uh, uh, at a discounted fee, uh, discounted fees. And of course, we're thinking not just about the Jewish uh, population coming from Ukraine, who are, by the way, uh, quite a sizable number. Uh, they, uh, uh, on some counts, they represent uh, uh, mm, about 400,000, in fact, uh, with Ukraine being uh, 40 uh, 45 million in country of 45 million but still that's a sizable number but we uh, we of course uh, uh, open these places uh, we'll be opening these places up 
to all and any in need. And uh, uh, that let me stop here. I don't want to steal the show from the most important topic that has brought us together, the book. Uh, so I hand over to Chaim to give us a brief introduction to the author and to the book, please. Handing over. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate very much your work and those of the many of uh, volunteers that have participated. Um, one fact that I was very moved by was an estimate that 70% of Warsaw uh, was involved in one way or another in welcoming and receiving and aiding uh, people who have come from Ukraine. Uh, very considerable uh, volunteer effort. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce uh, our guest, uh, Dr. Eliana Adler. Uh, we are privileged to have uh, with us a, a person who has written a groundbreaking book, uh, which has um, mobilized uh, my imagination, and I hope your imagination, because it has succeeded in a way that a, a history book should succeed. And it's uh, marked by different stages of how uh, Dr. Adler has written and comprehended her subject. Not only has she understood in a profound way the history and the uh, conflicts um, that uh, faced uh, Jews uh, going east towards the Soviet Union, having to choose uh, what to do to stay or to uh, flee, um, but she has also provided us with the voice of the people who uh, experienced these uh, events. Uh, it is not um, a surprise to tell you that often the voices of the um, survivors of these events were discounted by historians and by people. And uh, the people that went east were often uh, victims of uh, a very serious uh, sense that when they returned to Poland and they uh, encountered what had happened to their, their families, their towns and uh, in Poland, um, their suffering uh, was seen as of little note. And um, many of them moved on to um, the displaced persons camps. Um, and by 1946, they were the majority of people in the displaced persons camps. But if you ask, what has the history been of this time? Very little has been organized and studied in a way that Dr. Adler has brought to our attention until now. In addition, Dr. Adler has thought about the question of refugees in general. This was prior to what we're experiencing now in Poland, but it is um, significant uh, that she has um, uh, provided an important chapter uh, that I was referring to when I thought about the question in America of the refugees that have just recently come from Afghanistan. Um, and the refugees at our southern border in America. Uh, but beyond that, uh, she is going to begin her talk with some remarks about the current uh, situation, and then we'll move to uh, discussion of her book. Um, she is um, the Associate Professor of History and the leader of the Program of Jewish Studies at Pennsylvania State University. Uh, she has had many fellowships um, at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, at Yad Vashem, uh, at the German Historical Institute of Warsaw, and the Humanities Institute at Pennsylvania State University. Um, I have uh, read not only her book, um, uh, Survival on the Margins, but one of the books that is not on the topic today, but we should bring her back to discuss, which is... Uh, uh, the book that uh, is, is um, co-authored entitled Jewish Literature and History, uh, Interdisciplinary uh, Studies. And I highly recommend it because of its profound um, way of allowing us to look over the shoulder of a person who's become at a very young age, one of the leading historians of our time. Um, there are many other uh, uh, plaudits to uh, express to uh, Dr. Adler. But one of them is her courage. Uh, this year she won a prize as uh, 
the uh, most important historical book uh, written uh, in 2021 um, from Yad Vashem. And also her courage uh, to um, decide that the company that she would keep as a historian uh, would be untrammeled by uh, associations that she did not want to have. And uh, so she rejected one prize that was offered to her. Um, we're deeply in her debt for what she is teaching us at this very moment, not only about our current moment, but about uh, our history. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much um, for that really beautiful introduction, Rabbi Bieliak, and also uh, Mark, thank you for telling us about some of the work that um, you've been involved with. It's so important. Um, so um, my book is a historical study of a particular group of refugees. And it has been terrifying in recent weeks to see how very current this topic is. I think those of you in Poland don't need any reminders about this, but um, in the US and in Israel, we are more distant um, from what's going on. And it's, um, it's almost impossible to believe. And I think particularly for those of us who study the Second World War or who are still thinking about the Second World War because of family histories, um, we're asking ourselves, can the Russians really be bombing those very same cities that the Germans bombed? Are there really refugees running across those same landscapes? And uh, I'd like to share with you um, some words of wisdom from a colleague of mine. Um, this is with her permission, um, a um, very uh, bright and impressive uh, anthropologist um, working in Kiev, um, Yulia Wojskich, has been uh, writing a diary and making it public. And so I want to read uh, these words. And by the way, I, I've kept in her um, typos. Um, she has beautiful English, but this is the, 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 she's writing in very difficult conditions. And she says, today I understood that I've got used somehow to the sound of the air alert, alarms, explosions, and our defense. Sometimes it seems to me that I can hear the sound of an air alert alarm, even when silence is all around. Evenings with a candle in darkness, with a cat on mine or mom's knees, and my mother saying all day that I have to leave Kiev. This was on day eight. She started saying this to me after the Russians bombed Kharkiv. After today's bombing of Chernigiv, all the invaders did in Kiev suburbs of Irpin and Bucha, my mother has become desperately anxious about me. She won't go anywhere anyway. She has her reasons, her job, she's responsible, I get it. She wants me to go to Western Ukraine alone. I protest, arguments all day long. Mom, we're two in our family. I don't wanna separate, I love you. I love you more. You have to go and save your life. Tears from both sides arguments and counter arguments. Me already feeling guilty and bad. Mom feeling overprotective and telling exactly we're now two in a family and you have to save your life. You're younger, you're the future. Me already feeling the shame of possibly leaving her and the cat. This, um, I mean, it, it sounds like it comes right out of my book of the voices that Rabbi Bileak was talking about, the kinds of choices that people were making, the kind of terrible decisions. Um, and also, of course, 
in the images of the bombing of Kiev in 1941 and, um, and last week. Uh, each war is unique. They have their own complex causes and outcomes, which in this case, we do not yet know. Yet what, and um, whatever the particular factors, all wars lead to death and displacement. And in fact, that's part of the purpose. And the human responses are also very familiar. The shock, the resilience, the deliberations. Um, Yulia's words and our responses to this war offer an important illustration, I think, of the dual themes of my book and of what I want to talk about today, which is history and memory and the ways that those interact. In this case, we cannot help but impose our collective memory, our post memory, because most of us were not alive during the Second World War on the present conflict. The bombing of Kiev by the Germans in 1941 looks an awful lot like the bombing of Kiev by the Russians in 2022. And the experiences and human reactions are undoubtedly also very similar. But we need history to understand the context and trace the paths of these refugees uh, in the past. Uh, so in this talk, I, want, I will spend most of the time talking about history, just uh, going over what happened uh, insofar as I can fit in, and um, then at the end get to the topic of memory. So just as each war is different, so too each family and each individual has a separate story. This map shows the travels of the Elsner family, beginning in Krakow, through Lviv, which of course is now Lviv in Ukraine, to the Arctic, to Sverdlovsk in Western Siberia, down south through what is now Uzbekistan in Central Asia and Georgia in the Caucasus, before returning to what had been Stettin uh, as part of Germany and which became Chechen, part of Poland. This single map, I think, gives a sense of the sort of vagaries of chance. All these stops along the way were unique to this particular family, and yet the movement across the map is common. The other thing that's very common in all of these stories is choice, um, making decisions. Polish Jews faced a series of crucially important choices, all without knowing the potential consequences. And the first one related to flight. So as is well known, I'm sure on September 1st, 1939, the Germans invaded Poland um, with a massive blitzkrieg and um, proceeded to move quickly across the country two weeks later the Soviets invaded and um, moved in from the east. And Poland, the Second Polish Republic, was quickly gone. All Polish citizens faced danger. Uh, many died due to bombings, due to the just conditions of war. And all had to decide or had to at least think about um the occupation that they were under and whether it was worth considering switching to the other side this question was particularly rife for polish jews slightly under half of the over three million pre-war uh, jewish community in poland found themselves under soviet rule and the remainder had to contend with the German occupation. No one, not even Hitler, knew in the fall of 1939 what would come. Polish Jews, however, had been reading the newspapers. They knew something about the Nuremberg laws and subsequent repressions 
of Jews in Germany. They had experienced the repercussions of the expulsion of Polish Jews from the Reich. They, along with the rest of the world, read about the November pogrom of 1938, dubbed Kristallnacht. Additionally, the soldiers who arrived in Poland had free reign to act upon the indoctrination they had received over the past several years. Jews, and especially Orthodox men who were the most visible, were humiliated in the streets right from the beginning in front of cheering crowds. Others were forced to clear up rubble from the bombing campaigns without tools or safety equipment. Intellectuals, journalists, political leaders, religious leaders, and anyone who had written anything about the Nazis, whether Catholic or Jewish, found their name on lists. If caught, they could be summarily shot or publicly hanged for maximum terror. So all of these factors suggest that it would have made a lot of sense for uh, anyone under suspicion and for all Jews to pack up from Western Poland what had been and go to what had been Eastern Poland. On the other hand, everyone knows that invasions are messy, that people act out, but once the occupation regime comes in, they tend to calm down. And of course, the Germans needed Poland to be somewhat of a functioning state in order to extract all of the wealth from it. Additionally, of course, all human beings have a natural tendency to want to be home and safe and with their people. Change is hard and home means safety. We don't know precisely how many Polish Jews fled into the newly Soviet territories. Estimates range from about 200,000 to about 500,000, but of course no one was counting. Even if we assume the highest numbers, we're still talking about a minority at most 20,000, uh, excuse me, 20% of the population. Most Polish Jews stayed in their homes. It was, of course, easier for the young and the unencumbered to make the decision to leave. In many cases, families even met and decided to send all of their young or all of their male members to the other side to check out conditions there and decide if the whole family should move. There was also an assumption that those people would be in greater danger from the Germans. Of those who left, many turned out returning. The route was treacherous and became more so. And family separation was painful and life in the Soviet territories was difficult. For Stalin, the Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression pact signed with Germany in August of 1939 was a tremendous opportunity to experiment with expanding Soviet hegemony. The revolution had proceeded in fits and starts in the USSR, but after 20 years, they knew what they were doing. They had a formula and they wanted to export it. Thus, beginning in September 1939, a process of rapid Sovietization began in the formerly Polish lands. Arrests of wealthy business executives, politicians, clergy, police officers, soldiers, members of political parties, and anyone else deemed potentially dangerous began immediately. In October, the borders were set and preparations for elections, in quotes, began. Of course, these were Soviet-style elections, meaning that a slate of approved candidates for national assemblies of the two regions now known as Western Ukraine and Western Belarus. Soviet functionaries came in to register the residents and inform them that they had to vote or face punishment. And then in November, the newly elected delegates in their first act requested annexation to the USSR. Overnight, the former Polish citizens all became Soviet citizens. They received new passports and they lost all of their private property. Along with this transformation of politics, there was a transformation of the economy, the uh, nationalization, the formation of collectives, switching of the ruble and devaluing savings in Polish currency, an ambitious Sovietization that reached into all areas of Polish life. All of the schools now had to function either in Belarusian or Ukrainian. Churches and synagogues were closed down, and religious functionaries 
functionaries who had not been arrested had to find other work. Soviet norms were introduced in cultural settings and workplaces. This meant praise for Stalin, the omnipresence of the NKVD or the security services, and a constant fear of informers. For all of the residents of the new Soviet republics of Western Belarus and Western Ukraine, the speed and severity of the transformation was dramatic. Many became impoverished overnight. The only way to survive was by selling their belongings on the black market, which itself could lead to arrest. And this, by the way, is a photograph of a man named Hershey Stapler selling, he's, he's walking down the street in Lvov carrying kerosene lamps to sell on uh, the black market. And he sent this to his sister who was still, he sent a photograph to her. She was um, in the German occupied territories. This was the last um, she heard from him. The refugee population faced all of these same obstacles with the addition of lacking staple housing and status. Many slept in shuttered synagogues. They had no legal papers. They searched for work and scrounged for food. It was during the winter of 1940, one of the coldest on record, that many elected to return to their homes and families under German occupation rather than live on the streets under Soviet occupation. However, in addition to the trials faced by residents and refugees alike, Soviet annexation also brought some advantages. In interwar Poland, strict quotas had made it almost impossible for Jews to advance in education or the professions. The USSR had no such limits. Jews could go to high school and even higher education. And many young people took advantage of these unprecedented opportunities. In the arts and culture as well, for those willing to toe the line and conform to Soviet standards, professional advancement and funding existed on a previously unimaginable level. Some Yiddish writers, actors, and other artists were able to find a steady living for the first time in their lives. Although, of course, they also had to learn to stay ahead of the ever-changing ideological demands. Life under the Soviets was challenging, but over time, they began to grow used to the expectations. They awaited the end of the war and the possibility of return to their own lives, but they found ways to survive, even the refugees among them. However, the Soviet state had other plans for the refugees. The first priority had been the residents, a much larger population. But after the implementation of Sovietization, um, the state came back to deal with the refugees. Initially, in the fall of 1939, they were offered the option of labor in the interior, in areas away from where they had already lived and where they had family and connections. A small number took up the Soviets on this offer because there were promises of, of um, comfortable living conditions and pay. Um, they soon sent back reports of terrible conditions and many even escaped. So others didn't sign up as a result. By the spring of 1940, the Soviets were concerned about this unregulated population and especially their involvement with the black market. And they issued an ultimatum. The refugees could either register for return to their homes under German occupation, or they could agree to Soviet citizenship, although their passports would require them to move away from the border areas. So another choice. Families met again and considered their options. Many were already in contact with their relatives back under German occupation. They knew about ghettoization, but their families assured them that it wasn't so terrible and encouraged them to come back. Additionally, the refugees had a fear of accepting Soviet citizenship. What if it meant that they could not leave after the war? Thus, the majority of Polish Jews registered to leave the USSR. They could not have known that the ultimatum was a test. The German authorities would never have let in thousands more Jews. They were trying to figure out what to do with their already large Polish Jewish population. By signaling their dislike for the USSR, the refugees had shown themselves to be unreliable and deserving of punishment, or at least of re-education. 
So the following June, June of 1940, in the middle of the night, over the course of two days, NKVD agents arrived at the dwellings of all of the refugees who had registered to return. They were told it was time to go, given a minimal amount of time to pack, taken under guard to train stations and loaded onto freight wagons. It was stifling inside. Most people hadn't had time to pack sufficient food, let alone water. They were frightened and disoriented, but at least they would be going home. However, when the trains left the station, they were going east instead of west. The packed wagons had only small windows. The signs were unfamiliar. It took a while before many realized that their lives had taken a major turn for the worse. Although in truth, they should not have been too surprised. In fact, arrests and deportations had been a regular feature of Soviet life, which they had seen taking place around them. Various groups within Polish society uh, had been taken away in previous months. Many had friends or relatives in Soviet prisons already. Most had seen neighbors and acquaintances swept up in earlier waves of deportation, yet they did not know the Soviet system well enough to foresee this eventuality. Packed into train cars, they came to see what had happened and to comprehend that they were on their way to labor camps in Siberia. Many spent weeks in train cars before being loaded onto trucks, or wagons for transport even deeper into the forbidding interior. In the end, most of the refugees did not end up either in Siberia or in labor camps. Most of them were sent to the Arctic, to the Urals, and to the Northern Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic. They were placed in what were called special settlements, a Soviet gulag designation for isolated towns entirely controlled by the NKVD. They were forced to do heavy labor, usually in forestry. A small minority of the refugees who were deemed more politically unreliable had in fact been to, sent to prisons and far more punishing labor installations. Despite these nuances of geography and Soviet terminology, for the refugees, this experience remained labor camps in Siberia. That's how they explain their experience. They were told that they would never be released. These shoemakers, homemakers, lawyers, and musicians were sorted into work brigades and informed that they would only be fed if they produced the required daily norm. This is a map of one of the special settlements drawn by a 14-year-old Polish Jewish boy in 1942 that you can see on the slide. It was a shocking and traumatic situation they lacked the proper training and equipment for the work. Many were injured or died in accidents. Others slowly starved, unable to complete their norms. The children and the elderly were the most vulnerable. The NKVD oversaw every aspect of their lives, making religious or cultural practices nearly impossible. At that moment, in 1940, it looked as though they had made a terrible mistake. Indeed, refugees in Special settlements received food and clothing packages from their relatives in ghettos. And even with that help, they were weakening due to vitamin deficiency, malnutrition, and inhumane conditions. In their testimonies and their memoirs, all mention the meager food and the enormous and vicious insects, the infections that would not heal, the loss of teeth. Winter is another common theme. It was beyond anything they could have imagined, and yet they had to keep working, even in the patched summer garments that they had left in. Many families buried members in the Soviet taiga and despaired of ever surviving. And then, quite unexpectedly, at least for Soviet citizens fed on propaganda, in the summer of 1941, Germany and its allies invaded the USSR. Stalin was woefully unprepared for the German invasion. The Soviets began to lose enormous swaths of territory and soldiers and out of desperation, Stalin came to the negotiating table with the United Kingdom and the Polish government in exile. One of the compromises um, was an agreement to a blanket amnesty of all Soviet, uh, pardon me, of all Polish citizens. 
Thus, in the late summer of 1941, these starving Polish Jewish laborers, along with all other Polish citizens who were still living at that point, um, were freed, um, granted quote unquote amnesty, although they hadn't committed crimes. The regulations should have allowed them back pay and train tickets, but most received nothing but their freedom. They had to decide now where to go and how to get there. And most of them elected to go south. They were exhausted from the cold and they hoped that the better climate might also mean more access to food. Additionally, as more and more released Polish citizens headed south towards Soviet Central Asia, that was an incentive for others to follow. They could not go home where the war raged, but at least they could be with others in a similar situation. And thus began the next phase of the refugees' wartime experience. After managing to reach Soviet, the Central Asian republics, chiefly the Uzbek and Kazakh, uh, but also the uh, Tajik, Turkmen and other neighboring areas, they had to start from scratch once again. They were not only in foreign territory, but in the midst of a major war. In existential peril, the Soviets were sending all medical and nutritional resources to the military. Meanwhile, the Soviet population itself was on the move as millions evacuated, either officially or on their own, ahead of the Germans and their collaborators. Most of these displaced Soviet citizens also moved southward into Central Asia. These republics, already under-resourced and with little infrastructure, were dreadfully ill-equipped to handle the surge in population. The refugees, lacking the connections and the know-how of Soviet citizens and on the bottom of the heap in terms of aid, suffered greatly. Many regretted their decision to leave the special settlements. At least they had shelter there. At least there was a way to earn food. Here they slept in the streets, easy prey to the class of thieves who stole valuables and even shoes from sleeping victims. Additionally, overcrowding and warmer conditions led to the outbreak of contagious diseases. Even families that had managed to survive the experience of deportation and labor began to lose members, as in this photo on the bottom left of the Eisen family next to the grave of their patriarch. The first year was the hardest. Eventually, most of the refugee Poles managed to find some kind of work and shelter. This frequently required several moves before a suitable location could be found. Their plight was also helped by the gradual improvement in Soviet conditions. The state began to reassert control. As the Soviets finally turned the tide of the war in late 1942 and 1943, morale also improved significantly. But even with better oversight and conditions, the Soviet system was not able to replicate the level of supervision that had existed before the war. This meant that even as the military was fighting for its life and Soviet citizens under Axis occupation lived in terror, those fortunate enough to reach the interior actually experienced a period of relative loosening of strictures. For the Polish Jews, this modicum of freedom offered a afforded a possibility of return to religious practices that had not been feasible in the special settlements. And the photo on the top left shows a group of Polish Jewish citizens in Central Asia baking matzah. On the bottom uh, right, we see a Polish school, um, Bukhara, Warszawa. So it's in Bukhara and they're, you know, hoping to get back to Warsaw. Um, and it, uh, both Catholic and Jewish children learning together. The Soviets also began to allow in letters and packages from abroad uh, in order to help feed their population. Groups across the world, and particularly the JDC, the Joint, organized aid to the beleaguered Polish Jews in the USSR. Here you see on the top right, the bulk goods, as well as individual packages uh, that were being collected in order to be sent by very complicated routes from Palestine overland across Iran and then by boat into the USSR. 
As conditions improved for the refugees, they began to imagine the end of the war and ponder their future. Would they be allowed to leave the USSR? What would they find on their return? News of the war and of the Holocaust slowly filtered in, but in a piecemeal fashion. They heard rumors of massacres and death, of German bestiality, but they did not know how much to believe. In many cases, Polish Jews served in the Red Army and liberated parts of Eastern Europe, sending back letters to their relatives and friends in the Soviet interior. When the war ended, Polish Jews began to send missives to their hometowns, seeking contact with loved ones. When they did not receive responses, they wrote again, assuming that their relatives had been forced to relocate and would soon return home. Even when they found out for neighbor, from neighbors that their parents had died, they could not grasp the scope of the destruction. This would only come with repatriation. In 1946, Stalin decided to allow Polish citizens to return to the newly forming post-war Polish state. The reasons for this decision have been debated. No one knows for sure, but it was a great relief to the refugees to finally have the possibility of returning to their homes. This photo shows the Yermas family, along with others, in front of the Polish train car they would board for repatriation. The return to Poland occasioned a number of important realizations. Firstly, the refugees faced the reality of the war and the Holocaust. Poland was devastated and the Jews had been murdered en masse. Their families, their homes, their communities, their entire civilization were gone. This was a great deal to take in. Moreover, the borders of the state had changed drastically. The Soviets refused to return the annexed territories, so the Allies compensated the Poles with a roughly equally sized chunk of German land. And this traumatized, cobbled together, reborn Poland would be communist. As if that was not enough, the refugees also began to realize that their countrymen were not pleased by their return. Poland had been an anti-Semitic state at times before the war, but the level of hatred that they saw on their return shocked the repatriates. The combination of these factors led to yet another decision point. Where should they rebuild their lives? Should they stay in Poland and seek to rebuild some semblance of what they once had? The photo on the top shows a man showing two Yiddish newspapers produced in post-war Poland, so showing something of the vibrancy of the refugee communities, uh, the returned, uh, made up of returnees and Holocaust survivors, of course. Um, but next to him, of course, is another man holding a gun protecting this um, Jewish institution, demonstrating some of the fraught nature of their efforts. Below him is a wedding photo the groom in his red army uniform returned to Poland as a liberator. The bride spent the war there, the sole survivor of her family. Back in Poland after the war, the small Jewish community, about 250,000 at its height, included both survivors who stayed in Poland and returnees. Many times they rebuilt Jewish life together. Some stayed in Poland, but more and more left. They moved to DP camps, like these two girls on the top right. Camp administrators noted that only the repatriates had intact families and young children. Those who experienced the Holocaust came as individuals and were fortunate if they could have babies after the war. And from the DP camps, the refugees and survivors together sought new lives abroad. And the yellowed photo shows a mixed group of Polish Jews on the exodus, embarking on a now infamous journey to Palestine, only to be turned back by British forces. We typically associate photos like this with Holocaust survivors, uh, but in fact, it's a group uh, mixed of repatriates and survivors who had stayed in Poland. And that brings me to my final topic, which is memory. 
Part of what drew me to this subject in the first place, and I should mention that I've just skimmed the surface, there's so many different points at which different possibilities happened and families went in different directions and it, it is not possible to tell it all, even in a long book, let alone in a short talk. Um, part of what I, why I wanted to tell this story is that it is so much part of the war and the Holocaust, and yet also apart from it. The Polish Jewish refugees began World War II with all other Polish Jews. They experienced the German invasion. They faced the same decisions, but their anomalous choice placed them not only out of Hitler's reach, but also outside of the frame of the war and its history and memory. Even when they returned and joined their Landsmen in Poland, in DP camps and elsewhere around the world, they were part of a refugee population and yet not considered to be survivors with all of the weight and respect that that identity came to represent. And just as Jews have not considered the refugees real survivors, so too they have been largely excluded both from Soviet and Polish memory of the war. The statue pictured here was erected in Warsaw in 1995 and will be familiar to many of you. Um, commemorating the Polish citizens who died in Soviet captivity during World War II. Amidst the many Catholic crosses stands a lone Jewish tombstone. So on the one hand, the creators of the monument recognized that Jews were among the Poles who suffered at Soviet hands. On the other hand, however, the whole tone of the monument is somber. For ethnic Poles, the Soviet occupation and deportation and, of course, mass murder in some cases was an unmitigated disaster on equal footing with German occupation. Yet for Polish Jews, despite very real hardships and losses, this is a story of survival. If there were a Jewish monument to this experience, it would look very different, but of course there is not. I hope through this book to encourage greater knowledge and engagement with the history and the memory of this adjacent and entangled war experience, as well as, of course, to sensitize us all to the ongoing plight of refugees. Thank you. Eliana, uh, thank you very much for this uh, remarkable um, survey of what is a much uh, more complex and uh, rich story in the book. Of course, it's my job and uh, the purpose of this uh, gathering to encourage people to actually uh, look into the book. Uh, we are now uh, opening uh, chat for questions and uh, uh, the questions will be uh, handled by uh, Dominika uh, Zakarczewska, who's the coordinator for Beit Polska, uh, who happens to be at this moment on a Fulbright in Chicago, um, and uh, she'll uh, take up the questions. Dominika? Uh, Eliana, let me thank you once again for uh, taking up this so important and unfortunately also uh, right now, uh, so much discussed uh, topic. Uh, and uh, let me have a look at the, at the questions. I see that they are uh, coming up. Uh, we have a question from uh, David Kaider. Uh, this book and the talk has been a source of immense gratification for me as it places uh, my father's story in a very helpful context. My question is the manner of return to Poland after a stay in the Central Asian Republics, by which I mean legal or illegal, and also by train, by wagon or walking. So it's a question about uh, the ways of returning back to Poland. And... Uh, let me just ask, would you like me to read, read a few questions and then uh, would you like to address them or is it better for you to do it one by one? Uh, certainly if there are related questions, I'd be happy to take them 
together. So let's start with, with this one. Mm -hmm. oh, um, most of the uh, Polish citizens who were repatriated from the Soviet Union uh, came officially through official means. It was organized. They had to register. They had to be on a list. They had to prove that they were Polish citizens. And you can bet that there were Soviet citizens trying to get out and some actually succeeded in doing so by manufacturing or finding Polish documents. And um, we actually have the names of those who repatriated officially, uh, which is very helpful because most of the rest of this journey, we have no idea of how many people or who was on it because it was um, either in the case of flight no one was keeping track, or in the case of deportation, um, the, uh, the organs that were keeping track, we still don't have access to their documents. So repatriation, we actually have a much better idea for those who came officially, and that began in early 1946 and continued sort of through 1946, but really culminating in June and July um, of about 200,000 um and but there were um other ways of getting back and those included with the red army um either in polish units or in uh, other soviet units and also included people who just found their way um so that's a smaller group but there were people who just decided they were going home and organized that and and found a way um it, the borders were somewhat open, uh, although it was difficult traveling conditions. Thank you. Uh, I see that there is also a question about possibility to contact you later on to ask some more questions and uh, probably will uh, like it's up to you we, we can uh, give this possibility later on or pass in the chat if you will decide to to share some possibility with uh, uh, with our participants and uh, I would like to uh, to take uh, another treat another question and this is about the presence of Catholics in Bukhara in Central Asia uh, uh, so to the first point um, I'm happy for you to share my email in the chat and it's also if you just look up my name I'm at Penn State it's easy to find my email um, and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions if I can do so. Um, so yes, um, in, in terms of, yes, Polish citizens who um, had been deported and then were amnestied as a whole tended to go south into the Central Asian Republic. So that's Jews and Catholics together. There's, uh, this is an overgeneralization. Um, the, in the labor camps um, and special settlements that in some cases were separate and in some cases um, Jewish and Polish, Polish Catholics were together, overall, not universally, um, there's a lot of sort of camaraderie and sense of shared difficulties and a lot of stories of people helping one another, you know, the, the Poles working on Yom Kippur to cover for the Jews so that they could pray and the Jews working on Christmas to cover for the Poles and that sort of thing. I mean, the Catholics. Um, um, that, for a number of reasons, which we can get into if we're interested and we have time, that sense of sort of a, a shared experience tended to break down once uh, after the amnesty and um, as people moved into Central Asia, um, again, there, there are always exceptions, but there tended to be more competition and um, uh, less of a sense of being, um, sharing the same experience. Uh, thank you for that uh, insight. 
Uh, I see that um, there is request also to um, say a little bit more about the Jews who arrived in Palestine and especially the army of Anders. Yeah, th this is what I meant, that it, there was just too much to fit in. So um, quite right that one of the sources of competition uh, after the amnesty was um, that a part of this same negotiation which led to the amnesty also created both um, some <clears throat> efforts to bring in the aid under Polish auspices in the Soviet Union and also the formation of a Polish military which would be uh, formed in the USSR which would then evacuate and fight with the allies. It's a whole complicated and very fraught story, but to break it down um, uh, to somewhat, uh, uh, you know, to somewhat do violence to all the details and the nuance here, the leaders of the Polish military, I would say both felt much more of a sense of um, um, connection toward Catholic Poles and a sort of desire and responsibility toward them, A, and B also had the perception, and this is a, an old anti-Semitic trope, that Jews made lousy soldiers. And as a result of this, although the, the percentage of Jews in the exiled or deported or refugee Polish population in the USSR was um, probably double or more their um, pre-war percentage of the population, which was 10%. So it's more like 20, 25, 30% of the um, Polish citizens in the USSR were Jewish. About uh, five or six, five to seven percent of Jews were able to get out with Anders' army that evacuated um, through, uh, th through Soviet territory into Iran and eventually went to fight. Um, included in the evacuees were soldiers, uh, particularly um, those who had some specialization, particularly um, medical um, or in some case entertainers also. Um, uh, Jews had an easier time getting into the military, but also orphans. Um, so then that, those evacuees, um, the civilians were sent in a number of di different direction, directions, really all over the world in many cases. Um, and the military moved, um, again, through a complicated and long route, uh, but spent some time in Palestine, uh, before they joined the fighting. And so there's this moment when these um, Polish Jews, first the orphans and later the military, along with other Polish citizens, uh, reach Palestine, which is a tremendous moment for the Yishu, for the Jewish community of Palestine, who have been feeling like Jews around the world, pretty powerless to do anything about the war to help Jews during the Holocaust. And suddenly there's this population they can embrace and help and the children are welcomed. And um, also the, um, the military professionals are welcomed and there was a sort of clandestine um, help was offered to them if they wanted to escape from the Polish military and stay in Palestine. Uh, and some did make that choice because they were Zionists and wanted to stay there um, or because they had found the conditions of anti-Semitism in the Polish military to be very difficult to take. But others did not and continued into Italy, terrible fighting, which Anders' army took part in. So there's this whole long other story that's happening that goes on in other directions, ending up in Scotland and in Egypt, all sorts of places that these refugees continue to be refugees. 
Thank you for this uh, insight. And uh, now let me uh, bring the question uh, brought by one of the um, listeners uh, about her parents deported to Siberia in 1940. Uh, I read that they were imprisoned for three months for not accepting Russian citizenship and later re released. The request is uh, if you could elaborate more about uh, this topic. I, I understand it's about this kind of experience. Yes. So there were um, two major efforts, but also some kind of minor efforts to try and get um, these refugees to accept Polish citizenship. So th those who had lived, who were residents, right, of Eastern Poland, they didn't have a choice. They were automatically, it didn't matter if they wanted or not, they became Soviet citizens. But the refugees were given sort of incentives which first of all, they didn't accept and that led to their deportation. But then later after the amnesty, there was another effort to try and get the refugees to become Soviet citizens. And um, a couple things about it I think are significant. One is that it gives us an idea that at that point in 1942, 1943, Stalin hadn't decided about repatriation. So at that point, there was an effort to keep them, just make them Soviet citizens, enough already, um, with them having this different status. Repatriation only began to make sense later when it became clear that the Soviet Union was going to be able to really hold on to Eastern Europe and be able to make Poland a communist state. So why not send back these sort of trained communist cadres um, into Poland? So that's one thing I think we learned from this um, effort. And the other thing is that there's a lot of, um, a lot of, a right, well, people write with um, both pride and shame about that period in their memoirs and in their testimonies. They talk about feeling like they had no other choice, that um, there was a lot of pressure brought to bear against them, that they had to accept Soviet citizenship and a lot of pain and shame around that. These refugees were in many cases really proud of their Polish citizenship. They were talking the whole time only of going back to Poland. They wanted very much to be back in Poland and they were proud to be Poles. And then there were some who were because of the particular conditions where they were, because of just their personalities, for all sorts of reasons, actually withstood the pressure. And sometimes that meant imprisonment. Um, sometimes that meant lack of access to resources. Sometimes it meant being um, mobilized for men into what was called the uh, Trude Armée, which is the um, sort of labor battalions. So there were all sorts of um, repercussions of these um, uh, passportization drives, as they were called. Can I uh, ask uh, Eliana uh, a question here along the same lines of the previous question, but asking specifically about can people get to archives that are in Tashkent and other places where people were? Are they open in any way to uh, researchers or individuals? Uh, what's available and yes the answer is yes and no i mean i wouldn't go right now if i were you but um yes um in a lot of these places where refugees and evacuees lived during the war there are archival materials available um, also the holocaust museum has been trying to cop copy a lot of those and bring them to Washington. So some certain Chuvash region, you know, certain areas, some of the materials from Bukhara, they have been able to bring to Washington. I did research in Almaty, in Kazakhstan. Um, however, uh, even when the, the ultimate oversight of these refugees was the NKVD, and those materials are also closed in all of those FSU states. So even in those places, um, there's a limit to what one can find. And I think one of, part of what was interesting for me about what I found and what I did not find 
on my um, trip there was that the Soviets treated um, Polish citizens as one group. They did not differentiate Jews in any way. So when you're doing your research on Polish Jewish refugees, that's very frustrating. But in terms of understanding how the Soviet system worked, I think it's kind of fascinating that really they weren't making any distinction and Polish citizens were a category. Eliana, we are uh, unfortunately at the uh, conclusion of our time. There are so many questions that um, are here and we appreciate your uh, generosity in giving us your uh, email so that people can uh, ask further questions. Uh, and I wanna thank you so much for uh, sharing with us uh, uh, the highlights of your book. Uh, I wanna call to people's attention the fact that um, we have uh, a number of opportunities for people to go deeper into uh, the, the work of your book and actually acquire the book uh, for themselves. I'm sharing screen now for just a moment. Uh, we've, uh, as I mentioned, uh, provided uh, an excerpt uh, from your book in both English and in Polish. Thank you for allowing us to do that and an essay um, on the problem of how to think about refugees and what it means to name and, and have a social construction about them. We've included a number of other topics um, and uh, we will shortly have information about um, the essays you've written uh, reflecting on the current moment. Um, we are uh, most appreciative of all that you have uh, shared with us today. I want to turn now to inviting people to our next uh, Freighted Legacy program, which will be April 10th, um, which will be uh, about uh, Polish Jewish art music um, and uh, invite you to uh, 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 come to the website. There will be uh, information and uh, you can uh, register for that topic. Um, and uh, we are uh, also wanting to mention that on uh, May 8th, uh, we will be uh, privileged to have a historian um, who will be sharing with us her book, um, Alexia, um, Natalia Alexium, uh, Conscious History, um, which in many ways is, I would say the, the precursor to what was going on in Poland um, and the surprising, I think, um, stand that the uh, Polish Jewish community made uh, in asserting its Polish citizenship in the 20s and 30s, led by uh, intellectuals um, known as historians. Um, most of the time, historians are not seen as leaders of um, the, uh, the societies they're in, but there was a very considerable um, uh, effort by Polish historians uh, that will be uh, discussed uh, from her book. Uh, we had a rich morning and we uh, thank you all. Um, I would remark that um, the work of uh, Freighted Legacies, uh, now the efforts that we are um, uh, involved in with helping refugees and uh, the support of the organizations that are a part of uh, putting all of this together uh, uh, Friends of Jewish Renewal and Beit Polska um, require your support. And uh, of course, we are foregrounding uh, the effort of helping refugees, uh, but uh, we're only able to do that uh, with your continued support of our, our work and especially our educational efforts. I wanna thank my colleagues, uh, Mark Yazowski, who has been translating in Polish and Marzena Szymanska, who translated also in Polish and is the person that translated the essays that um, are on our website uh, into Polish. Uh, I wanna thank also our colleague, uh, Dominika Zakraszewska, who puts uh, so much effort and time, including a lot of worry and concern into uh, helping our uh, programs and our uh, community uh, to move forward. Um, again, uh, Dr. Adler, thank you very much. And we wish everyone 
that we will see a day that will dawn with peace. Um, thank you all.